Today I want to talk about this. This is a CompuKit 101, as I'm sure you probably recognise. It was a popular home computer here in the UK from the late 1970s. Now, I also want to talk about this. This is also a popular home computer from the late 1970s. It's an OSI Superboard 2, with a few extra bits added. Now, if you look at these machines side by side, you know, forget the extra bits, then they look quite similar. In fact, they look very similar. And there's a reason for that. The thing is, the Superboard 2 was created by a slightly disorganised but well-established computer company based in Ohio in the United States. Let me put my flag in there. OK, close enough. The UK 101 was created by a pirate called Spangles Muldoon in New Barnet. In the 60s, Spangles Muldoon was a pirate radio DJ and worked for stations such as Radio Caroline and Radio North Sea International and was based on ships in the North Sea. Later on, uh, Spangles Muldoon worked for the pop service, the English pop service, uh, coming out of Radio Luxembourg. When I was a kid, back in the 60s, there were no pop radio stations to listen to. Um, the BBC had a monopoly um, and they wouldn't let you set up any radio station of your own, um, so you were stuck with the BBC Light programme. So as long as you could rig up a decent aerial, pirate radio stations were the way to go. Anyway, the point is, Spangles Muldoon, aka Chris Carey, set up a company called Comp Limited in New Barnet with Bill Wood to sell computers. It was known as Comp Shop. As far as I can tell, they weren't newcomers to either business or electronics, but they were quick to realise that home computing was going to be the next big thing. So, um, the Practical Electronics magazine of April 1979 um, started to show adverts for the Superboard 2 from Comp Computer Components. Now, they're also listed in the back as Teleplay, which are from the same address as Comp Limited. So I suspect that was their earlier name when they were doing video games mainly. Um, anyway, the point is that they were advertising the Ohio Superboard 2 um, and taking deposits for it. Now, two months later, so that's two months later is July 1979, uh, their advert now says that they've got the first one in the UK. Um, bear in mind this is June. Now, a month later in July, the Superboard 2 has been dropped and we now have a UK 101. It was described as a low-cost Superboard, with a small s, um, with everything a Superboard, with a small s, should have. Which is a bit odd because if it didn't have those things it wouldn't be a Superboard, would it? But anyway exactly what it was became clear um, in the August edition, a month later, uh, 1979, when uh, Anthony uh, Burke um, described it in full detail. It was a pirate copy of a Superboard 2 made by Chris Carey, um, aka Spangles Muldoon. I don't know how he got away with it, but he did. As I mentioned, there are some differences between the machines. Um, but if you look at them closely, they're, they're remarkably similar, um, even down to track layout and component positioning. Later in his career, Chris Carey, aka Spangles Muldoon, took pirating to a new level in that he created some unofficial, or well, many, unofficial B Sky B decoder cards. Um, it was a big business for him. Uh, he got into a lot of trouble with Sky, obviously, and it did result in a rather serious prison sentence. Um, but maybe we'll leave that one for another time. Today, the UK 101 is a much-loved machine on both sides of the Atlantic and tends to be referred to as a sibling of the Superboard 2 rather than a blatant copy, which is quite nice, really. So what were they? Well, they were a 6502-based machine, a bit like the Apple II or, or, or the PET, but, but obviously way, way cheaper. For around £250, you could get yourself going with a 4K machine and, and Microsoft Basic. It had a built-in keyboard, an output for a monitor, and in the case of the UK 101, a TV output as well. So when the Superboard was being advertised, it was often bundled with, or it could be bundled with, a UHF uh, TV modulator. Um, because it hasn't got a modulator on it, the Superboard 2, you'd have to have an external one. Now, I'm not sure how well that would have worked with the uh, output, the video output, being a US standard. Now, it's not hard to see why the UK 101 was introduced in the UK, this is the UK 101, it's on a UK monitor, 
Um, it could have been used in a TV set, of course, in the back in the day. Um, but if we turn it over to the Superboard 2, you can see the problem. Now, I can fiddle around with the back to get that steady, um, but it, all the display ends up a bit shimmery and odd and what have you. Okay, so here, here's, I've just adjusted the tally at the back there. So the Superboard 2 is kind of working. Um, where are we? Let's have a just do cold boots. But you can see it's all a bit shimmery and a bit wibbly wobbly. And of course, if you want to use the monitor or the TV for anything else, well, you can't, can you? Hmm. So back in 1979, um, the most technical thing that we had in our house would have been the TV. It was a big uh, black and white set in a big wooden cabinet. Um, it was rented from Radio Rentals for 30 bob a week. Um, and if you look around the back, you could see this kind of cardboard, fibreboard kind of flimsy back on it, with a few slots in it. And if you looked in the slots, you could see all the valves glowing. And on the back, on this cardboard back, there was two stickers. One said, live chassis, do not touch. And the other said, danger, high voltage. Now, very few people knew how a TV set worked back in 1979. Um, and having seen the two warning stickers on the back of it, weren't keen to find out. Now, just before making this video, I asked my wife B whether she, back in 1979, would have understood how a TV works. And she said, of course, it works by magic. So picture the scene back in 1979 where I'm trying to connect my newly built UK 101 to the back of our telly. Um, my dad sat in one corner waiting for the wrestling to start and my mum sat in the other corner waiting for some sort of explosion. Well, to be fair, we did have an incident, but, but that's another story. Anyway. The thing is, we switched it on and we got this. None of us cared much about this new electronic brain that was sitting on the living room floor because we were all mesmerised by the fact that I'd taken control of this highly dangerous glowing piece of furniture that worked by magic. So up until this historic moment, the only people that had been able to put something on our telly were the BBC or the ITV. And here I was defying the laws of magic. I mean, it's an incredible moment, really, and it wouldn't have mattered at all if the if the display of the of the computer was a bit skew if It was just amazing. I guess it must be hard for our younger viewers to kind of maybe understand how amazing it felt to put your name or whatever on your television. You've got to remember that in 1979, there were still people out there that thought the Earth was flat and that the pixies inside your TV somehow made it work. Anyway, apart from the UK-based mods that the UK 101 had, I think for many people, the attraction of the UK 101, I would say the Superboard, was that it was featured in Practical Electronics quite a lot. There was the original articles, but there were, there were loads of articles, really. Now, I don't remember if this was an official project, but it certainly felt like one. So for many uh, electronics hobbyists, the UK 101 was an obvious choice, really. Obviously featured in the magazine. It was relatively simple and therefore reasonably hackable. Because of the hackable nature, it was very common to see the machines naked like this. But if you were really keen, uh, you could add, you know, you could add a bit of professionalism by buying yourself a case, such as this kind of polycarbonate thing here, if that's what it is. Um, you could get these in a dirty cream colour like this, or in a, uh, in a bright orangey red sort of colour. Uh, mine came with this polystyrene wedge, uh, which went inside and allowed the keyboard to sit at the right angle. So maybe not quite as professional as we first thought. I mean, obviously having it naked like this allowed you to do mods really easily. But to be honest, the case never really got in the way of the mods. Uh, not if you had a drill and a hacksaw anyway. Now, obviously many people made their own cases out of wood and plastic and Lord knows what. Um, but I just want to show you one that was made in recent years. This was actually for the Superboard 2, but obviously the principle's the same. This was done by Howard. Um, he's a member of the OSI forum who were very helpful to me, I mean incredibly helpful to me in getting my OSI machines up and running properly. So a big shout out to them and thank you. Uh, and thank you for Howard for letting me show these photographs. Uh, the case is incredible. Now getting hold of a UK 101 or a Superboard 2 for a reasonable price can be quite tricky nowadays. Um, so I thought I'd investigate a few options. So this machine here is a genuine non-original uh, Superboard 2 that was built by a mate of mine called Dave, aka Devilish Design, with the main circuit board designed by Grant at Clyball.com. So many people would describe this as a replica machine, um, but it's only the circuit board that's a replica, all the other components are real. Now this is not the cheapest option, um, so I thought we'd investigate a few others. Mm. But this is a Grant Searle designed UK 101, 
that doesn't have any display circuitry and uses a serial um, terminal to access it. It's referred to as a Micro Yuko 101. Um, and a big shout out to Steve Gray for creating the circuit boards to make one of these easy to build. It's certainly a cheap way to get yourself a, a UK 101, uh, but without the quirky video circuitry that a UK 101 or a Superboard has, it's maybe not quite the, the authentic experience. Having said that, um, this is the Micro Superboard 2 uh, circuit board, and they're pretty similar, so it may be more authentic than we first thought. This is different though. This is a UK 101 built using a Cyclone 2 FPGA board. Again, the design is from Grant Searle, um, and it's easily, easy to build, but to make it even easier, I've built it on a multi-comp board, um, I've got a spare one here, uh, that Neil Crook gave me. Uh, I've got a spare one to build a Superboard 2 on. So it's got a, a composite out, a proper serial port, um, and I've added some extra memory to sort of make it more useful. Now this is the real deal, you get the proper experience here of a UK 101, and to be honest, it's reasonably cheap to build, especially if you shop around for the Cyclone 2. I think the total build cost for this was something like uh, 30 quid, something like that. The only problem I have with it really is that, that you use a PS2 keyboard. Now that works perfectly, don't get me wrong, um, but, it, but the experience feels wrong. Um, everything else is so good that I think it needs a proper keyboard. So I thought what I'd try and do is use this Cherry keyboard which is, is very close to the, the original keyboards in terms of layout and so on. Um, so that, that's that. I've just got to convince Neil Crook to uh, sort out the FPGA code for me. So if there's a Superboard 2, there must be a Superboard 1. Well, there is. It's here. Here's one I made earlier. Actually, that's not quite true. Um, this was made by Jonathan Chapman of Glitchworks. Um, he, he made one and, and he let me have it. Um, this is a replica of an OSI 400 board. Uh, I say replica, it's only the board that's replica. All the components and the bits of wire and everything, they're real. If you've ever looked at the OSI catalogues for their machines, the naming and numbering can get a bit confusing. Uh, and it's, it's no different for this board either. Um, the number changes depending on what processor you've got in it. So this is a 400 uh, CPU board, but if you put a 6502 in it, it becomes a 412. If you've got a 6800 in it, it becomes a 413. And if you have a 6501, well, I've no idea what it is, to be honest. Anyway, this is uh, one board that I did build myself earlier. Um, Dave, again, a, aka Devilish Design, gave me a Glitchworks uh, processor board, just the bare board, and, um, well, I've, I've built it up. Um, so this is a replica, I suppose you'd say this was a replica OSI Model 502 board. Now I say replica, it's only the board that's replica, the components, the bits of wire and so on, they're all real. So this board, like the 400 um, that we looked at earlier, um, will work standalone. Um, very similar, except in this case it's got the basic ROMs um, as part of the, this function. So you get a much more convenient to use uh, board as a standalone unit. I mean there were loads of boards that OSI made, so you could build up a whole system with uh, CPU, memory, video and so on. And that's how their machines were basically built. So, looking at my Superboard 2, it obviously has some extra bits added. Um, when Dave brought this over, uh, it came with this memory, this OSI 610 expansion card, this extra memory. Um, now, as I say, it's a memory expansion, but it also has, uh, it acts as a floppy disk controller card. Just as there's no video controller chip on the main boards of these machines, it's done through, uh, you know, uh, discrete components, if you like. Um, similarly, the expansion board with the floppy disk controller part that's similar. It doesn't have a. That's the same. It doesn't have a floppy disk controller. It just has a series of logic and a serial and parallel port to do all the work. Now, at this point, I must give a big heartfelt shout out to all the guys on who helped me on the OSI forum uh, to get these boards working properly. Um, when I got it off Dave, the baseboard was working fine, and we had the extra memory. Uh, that was fairly easy to set up. But we did have a few um, discussions and control uh, and issues around this this board here. Now this is a data separator board. Now it's needed in my case because I don't have the original type of drives that the board was designed for. The original disc had a clock signal and a data signal sort of combined on a single single wire within the ribbon cable. But the latest Shugat drives they had them separated. So this is a, a modern implementation of a data separator, something to separate those two things out. 
Various ones were published in magazines back in the day so that you could use sugar goat drives because they were easier to get. Um, and this is kind of modern re-implementation of it. I mean, I'm just using a GoTech at the moment uh, and that works perfectly fine, it's great. Um, which leads us nicely on really to the disk operating systems that were available for this machine. Okay, um, so I've moved things around a bit. Um, I've got rid of the UK 101, popped it safely over there. We've got the Superboard 2, of course. I've changed the monitor for something that's a bit less wibbly wobbly. And, and I've popped this little camera here so we can get some close up shots of the screen. Now, the first OS that probably ought to show you is OS 65D, which was the main OSI operating system for. Um, their kind of machines, their business machines at least, and, and those that ran five, five and a quarter inch discs. Um, this was it's an operating system that used 24K of memory, so it may be not ideal for a Superboard 2 user because they generally, these hobbyist machines, generally didn't have that much memory. Now, OSI came up with a smaller um, operating system for use in these kind of machines called PicoDOS. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, now, 65D um, does seem to be um, a reasonably complete operating system. Um, there's a few games here which I'm not sure how good these are, to be honest with you. Um, but these are from the tutorial discs that you would have got with the machine. Um, yeah, so you get the idea. Uh, yeah. So, the operating system that, that most of the people I knew were using was a one called Hexdos. So, let's have a quick look at that. Okay, so Hextos was written by Stephen Hendricks. Um, let's just boot this. And you can see it runs through BASIC. So it's kind of an addition to BASIC, if that's the right way of putting it. Um, we get a nice little menu here. Um, various games and bits and bobs. We don't actually need the menu. Um, here we are back in BASIC now. Um, we can just prove that. Oops, hang on. There we go. Um, and if we want a directory listing, we would just use the basic command load, but with a forward slash. And then we would list. I want to say you get a basic listing of your directory, I mean a basic listing of your directory. Because this is a basic program. Not that it'll run, of course. Um, but what it means is that we can load, um, load a program as we want. What have we got? Um, backgammon? Why not? And then we can run that. Um, let's have a look at Pico DOS. And that's it loaded. Uh, simple. Now, if you want a directory listing of um, uh, on Pico DOS, it's really simple. You just look at the piece of paper that you wrote it down on. Um, so if we pick item five, I'll just put that there. So there are eight, typically eight, um, programs that you can load onto the disk and they're referred to by number. Um, the problem is, of course, you have to write them down to uh, remind yourself what they are. I'm told there's also a version of 65 DOS available for the OSI machines. I've not tried it. Uh, if anybody out there has, then give me a shout or leave a note in the comments. That'd be great. Be interesting to see how you got on with it. Um, I think my favourite is Pico DOS. It's really simple. It only uses 12K or just over 12K in some cases of memory. Um, and you've only got to remember the eight programs. It's really simple. No commands, anything like that. It's just nice and easy. So in a nod to the UK 101's connection with radio, albeit pirate radio, um, I thought I'd get it doing something useful. So I thought I would uh, connect it to a radio receiver to receive the MSF atomic clock signal and get it to decode it. Because it's something I did back in the day. Now I built the receiver, there it is, turn it on, and there it is flashing away, uh, picking up the MSF signal. Um, so all I need to do is connect it to the UK 101 and write some software. Uh, but to be honest, I couldn't be bothered. Um, I guess I had more enthusiasm back in the day. So for now, I'll leave it at that. Uh, so don't forget to subscribe, like, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I'll see you next time. Push it then. I am pushing it. Is this the best you can find? Yes, it's the only one I have.